Hi there, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today we'll be going through this paper which is titled as Reformulating Unsupervised Style Transfer as Paraphrase Generation. It is from the authors from UMass and CMU. So it is a very recent one. It will be presented as a part of 2020 EMNLP proceedings. Okay, so if you analyze the title, there are three major keywords that we need to understand first before we go on with reading on the paper. So the first one is unsupervised, then style transfer, and the last one is paraphrase generation. So let's talk about all of these three. So the first one is unsupervised. So the class of unsupervised algorithms basically deal with the problem when you don't have the pre-labeled data set. So if you remember, in supervised, you already have a pair of x, y, where x is nothing but the actual data and y is the label associated with that. So for example, if x is a sentence, y could be a sentiment. It could be either be neutral, positive, or negative. And the aim in supervised learning is to basically learn a function f that takes an input x and maps it to a label y. So this is the entire idea of the supervised learning. So now if you just take out y from here, you'll just be left with the values of x, which is nothing but the data points in that space. So unsupervised learning essentially just works on these samples and tries to find the latent patterns, which indirectly says there is very minimalistic human supervision required and mostly wherever it's required is during the evaluation cycle. So yeah, that is unsupervised learning as such. Now talking about style transfer. So I'm pretty sure you guys already know about style transfer in the context of computer vision, where the idea is to do an image to image translation. So you are given an input image, let's say I, and you give certain pattern, let's say you give dots, or maybe certain pattern lines. And the output is that you get an image that is painted or basically textured with these kind of patterns, whatever you give at this input level. So this is essentially style transfer in the computer vision domain. Now taking a similar idea for NLP, you can think of an example, let's say any sentence that is written in any course book and let's call it S. If you were to rewrite that sentence for a social media post, let's say for Twitter, you would add certain nuances that are specific to that social media platform. So that is, let's say S dash. So we want to learn a function F that takes this sentence S and converts it to S dash. So this is one of the examples of style transfer. Another example would be picking out something from Shakespeare in English and rewriting it to post it on social media. So how do you simplify or basically change the style of language, the way Shakespeare used to write and convert it into something, let's say, that can be posted on Twitter. So yeah, these are certain examples that I could think of in terms of style transfer. So with these examples, if we analyze the patterns to what is exactly happening in style transfer, couple of things that come to my mind are like sentence structure would be different. So a sentence could be formulated in certain way in Shakespeare books, but could totally be different if you write it in normal English or probably on social media. So sentence structure is one thing. Then the vocabulary would be definitely different. Then the placing of punctuations. How do you use punctuations in the language would be different for both the text and the word usage pattern would be different where you'll find certain prominent biograms that are used in certain texts but don't usually occur in different text. So all these are a couple of parameters, there could be more, that are usually transferred or learned by a model M, which is given text in certain style and is asked to translate that sentence into another style. Okay. So with this, we wrap up our understanding about what is style transfer. Now talking about paraphrase generation. Paraphrase generation can be understood as rewriting certain piece of content that has same semantic sense but different syntactic structure. So you must be a little confused now because paraphrase generation looks more or less similar to style transfer and which is actually true that's why the authors have also kind of modeled style transfer as a paraphrasing problem. So the difference that style transfer has is that it expects to unlearn the attributes that were there in the source style and learn certain attributes that are very specific to the destination style which is the style that you're trying to generate. Whereas paraphrase doesn't have this concept. So it just works for a given style for any sentence where it tries to rephrase a certain aspect of sentence by preserving its semantic context. So yeah, that is the main difference. So with this, let's move on to abstract and see the approach that the authors propose. So authors start by defining what is style transfer so that we've already seen. In this paper, we reformulate the unsupervised style transfer as a paraphrase generation problem and present a simple methodology based on fine-tuning pre-trained language model on automatically generated paraphrased data. Okay, so the first step looks like they are fine-tuning a pre-trained language model. 
that generates paraphrase sentences for the original sentence. So as we can see, authors have also mentioned about automatically generated paraphrase data, which kind of hints me towards they have like the first model that does a paraphrase generation. So they must be having some paraphrase data set that is of sentence one and sentence two, where sentence two is kind of paraphrase of sentence one. So this way they kind of fine tune the language model to generate its paraphrase. And then this essentially gets feed into a different model that does the style transfer. Okay. And the authors claim that they have significantly outperformed the state of the art style transfer system on both human and automatic evaluation. And they have tested all of this over 11 different styles. So which is a pretty extensive evaluation. And while they were doing a survey of 23 style transfer papers, they found the automatic matrix that people use can be fooled easily. So they also propose a new evaluation matrix for this problem. So if I were to note down the contributions of this paper, I am seeing that they are trying to solve a problem statement which is style transfer, that too in an unsupervised setting. And they have their extensive evaluation set which is 11 different styles. And they are outperforming the state of the art algorithms on human as well as automatic evaluation. And not only that, they also propose a new automatic evaluation matrix for these tasks. So which is pretty awesome. So let's see this diagram that kind of summarizes the entire flow and the algorithm that the authors propose. So as we can see, authors have defined both the training and the testing flow. So let's see the training time first. So you have a sentence S that's written in some style. So it looks like a Shakespearean writing style. It goes through some model, let's call it M1 and it returns some paraphrase version of this. So this is a step on what they call as diverse paraphrasing. We'll see into detail what this model actually is and what it does. So once you have the normalized or the paraphrased version of the original sentence that was there in some style, you pass this again to another model that they define with this red arrow. Let's call this M2, which again tries to retranslate into the original style. So you can see again, the loss function would be calculated against what the original sentence was. So this is what they call as inverse paraphrasing. Yeah, so this totally makes sense because from this point you are generating a paraphrase and from here you are training a model that does the inverse of the paraphrasing. So you get the original sentence. Similarly, if this was the input sentence, which is from Twitter style of writing, you pass it through same model, which is M1. You get a normalized or the paraphrased representation for that sentence. You pass it through a different model, which is M3 over here. And again, you would do a loss against what the original sentence was. So in total, you have three models. One is marked with this black color, which they call as diverse paraphrasing, where any kind of a sentence would be normalized under the same scheme. And then you have M2, which is red color model that takes this input of this normalized sentence and tries to produce the original sentence, which was in Shakespeare style. And this blue color model that takes in the input again, the normalized sentence and tries to reproduce the Twitter style of writing. Okay, so these will be the three models that you train. And during test time, if we see, if we were to change the style of a sentence that is written in Shakespeare style to something that you would put on the Twitter. So if this is a sentence, you pass it through your model M1 that we already seen. It generates a paraphrase or the normalized version. And once you have that, you plug in the blue color model, which is nothing but M3. So which is this one, which was trained against tenses that have Twitter like style. So you plug in that sentence and you have a newer sentence that holds the nuances of how people would write on Twitter. So with this, you can see we have created a pipeline. You give in Shakespeare sentence and you'll have an output, which is a Twitter version of that. So this is the full flow, how style transfer would work with the approach that the authors have proposed. Okay. So now let's see and dig into what step one and what step two are in more detail. So this is how they formally define the model in two steps. So the first step is to consider a corpus of sentences of multiple styles where the set of all sentences from style I is denoted by XI. So let's consider the style of writing that we have on the source is from Shakespeare's books. So that is denoted as I and considering it has, let's say one lakh sentences. So all of that set makes up XI. We first generate the paraphrase Z for every sentence X using a pre-trained paraphrase model f para okay so yeah this is exactly what we have discussed in the figure for every sentence from that style you pass it to a model that is f para which is a paraphrase model that they already have pre-trained and you get a representation z and you step this repeat for all the x's that are there in the capital x 
which means you essentially make a set that is capital Z, where you have a one-to-one -one mapping to the source. So they call this thing as pseudo parallel corpus, what they have created between each of the original sentence and its paraphrased version. Okay, so this is the first step, what they do. And as a part of second step, where they talk about doing an inverse paraphrasing. So in this, they use the pseudo parallel corpus that we've just seen that reconstructs the original sentence X given its paraphrase Z. Since F para removes style identifiers from its input, the intuition behind this inverse paraphrase model is that it learns to insert stylistic features through the reconstruction process. Okay, so what they're saying is F para is essentially doing a normalization and it is removing any style that was there in the source sentence. So in this case, if the input was in the Shakespearean writing style, F para should ideally remove all the stylistic features that are very particular to the writing style of Shakespeare. Then the work of inverse paraphrase model would be to take that bland input and insert stylistic features against the style for which we are training. So in this case, it would be training against the original sentence which was in the Shakespearean style. So the model is essentially learning to reconstruct or to add the attributes that are very specific to the Shakespearean style. Okay. So this is done using standard language modeling objective which is cross entropy. For every paraphrase sentence that you have from capital Z, you get its inverse and you have the predicted sentence. You take its loss against the original sentence and you do it over all the sentences and you have the final loss you back propagate you adjust the weights and the final aim should be that x bar comes as close as possible to x okay so now the authors discuss the paraphraser implementation with gpt2 so this is the m1 model what we just saw as f para so this is the implementation for that they're using gpt2 model for doing this so gpt2 for all of those who don't know is a language model that takes in word by word as an input and tries to produce the next word at any time t by looking at all the words that have occurred before. So this way it's also called autoregressive in nature because it's only allowed to look in one direction and that is to its back. So I'll link a couple of videos in the i button. Feel free to check them out. I have explained GPT-2 in much detail over there. Okay. So it looks like not only the M1 model but also the inverse paraphrase model is a GPT-2 based model as they mentioned over here. So the way you would train a GPT-2 in an encoder free sequence to sequence modeling is that let's say you have a sentence Z which is the output from the paraphraser model and let's say this has 10 words so we'll stack all the 10 words side by side so this is the input along with some separator token let's say you give it as SCP1 and then you'll stack the sequence of outputs that you expect so this will be all the tokens from X and let's say X has eight tokens. So this will be all of the eight tokens. Now you train your language model on this input and during inference, you will provide your model with this much segment as your input and your model will start outputting tokens from the X distribution, one token at a time. So this is how typically, if you want to really use GPT-2 for doing a sequence to sequence modeling. So this is the technique how you would go about doing it. Okay, moving forward. In this segment, authors talk about how did they generate data for training the paraphrase model. So they discover that maximizing the lexical and syntactic diversity of the output phrases is a crucial for effective normalization. Okay, so what they're saying is the kind of data set that they wanted to generate for training the paraphrase model, the paraphrases have to be really diverse because if that's not the case, then the paraphrase model would just end up learning, swapping on certain phrases here and there while preserving the semantic meaning. But the authors wanted the output to be kind of generating newer words and not use all of the words that are part of the input. So that is what they mean by syntactic diversity. Okay. So they choose this corpus which is para and empty 50 million. It's a large corpus of back translated text. So they basically apply three filters to achieve the subset from those 50 million sentences which had high diversity. So the first filter essentially removed the sentence pair with more than 50% of the trigram or unigram overlap to maximize the lexical diversity. Okay, so this looks like a jacquard similarity over trigrams and unigrams. If it's more than 50%, you essentially remove those sentence pairs. So with this, you're kind of discouraging the copying. So with this, the output sentence would have less than 50% of the overlap in the terms of trigrams and bigrams. Okay. So talking about the second filter, they remove the pairs with lower than 50% of the reordering of the shared words, which they measure using Kendall tau. So Kendall tau is a non-parametric function 
that measures the correlation between two ranked list so it's mostly used in ranking systems so authors in this point are essentially trying to say for any word that was shared still in the common vocabulary of source and destination if the reordering of those words is less than 50 percent which means most of the words are new or either have been shuffled in the destination sentence then only they keep those sentences if that ratio is less than 50 percent then they remove those sentences the last filter that they impose is removing pairs with low semantic similarity which they measure using the same model so this is pretty clear so after you have applied all these three filters the data size shrinks from 50 million to 75k sentence pairs over which they fine tune their gpt2 model so we have already seen the formatting and the way you would train a gpt2 model in a decoder only sequence to sequence fashion okay so let's move forward so this is the last leg of the paper i believe where author talk about evaluating the style transfer systems so they mentioned that the previous methods were based on the individual matrix which were transfer accuracy semantic similarity and the fluency and there doesn't exist any single number that would kind of combine all of these three metrics for a fair evaluation okay then authors discuss each of these metrics in detail talking about transfer accuracy you essentially train a classifier that says if the style was transferred or not so this is very simple like you given a sentence it says zero or one if it's one then it's of that style else it's of different style so you can think of making such model by sampling sentences from shakespeare work and from some random wikipedia sentences and you train a binary classifier over there if your aim is to have a style transfer system between these source and target pairs so most of the previous methods used to use one layer cnn for this task but as we know like the bird outperforms cnn most of the nlp task the kind of fine-tuned a robot a large on all the data sets that they had so here they have introduced a change instead of using a cnn model they are fine-tuning a robot a large model okay talking about the second which is semantic similarity they mentioned that most of the previous works like 15 out of 23 papers have used n-gram matrix like blue and we know like blue is not a well-defined matrix when it comes to doing a comparison between a generated sentence and the actual reference sentence because it is based on a n-gram overlap between both the sentences. So authors in this paper measure the semantic similarity using the serve word embedding based of the sim model. So I'm not sure about how sim model works, but it's clear that it's a sub word model that works at embedding level. So I'll try to link this paper in the description. If you're interested, do check that out. Okay, so talking about the last metric, which is fluency, which essentially checks if the system has produced an ungrammatical output or not. Okay, so for this, they again train a Roberta large model on Cola Corpus, which contains sentences paired with grammatical acceptance judgment. Okay, so this is again pretty straightforward classifier based model. So given a sentence, it would say if it's grammatically acceptable or not. Okay, moving forward. Yeah, so this was a formula that the authors have introduced. It kind of merges all three individual matrix and gives you an overall score for a fair comparison. Here X is the sentence from text corpus capital X. So for every sentence, you calculate its accuracy, similarity and fluency. You multiply all of these three and then divide by the number of sentences in the test corpus. So as we can see, this is a pretty strict metric because accuracy and fluency are a binary classifier model that is Roberta large. So if any of the value is zero, the whole score essentially becomes zero. Yeah, so that's what they have written over here as well. Okay. Then they talk about the data set and experiments. Okay, so I guess we are done with the paper now. So before that, one more diagram was there. On the left hand side, you have all the original sentences, which are from different styles. So you can see a different clusters being formed for every style. And when you have trained the paraphrase model, everything kind of gets dispersed in that space. That kind of says that the sentences from different style have been normalized. That's why we are not seeing any clusters out there. So yeah. So that was the last thing, I guess. Uh, so we are done with the paper. So this is really a good work that the authors have done in this domain. And the paper was written beautifully. It was extensive, had all the details. So cheers for that. So if you guys like the walkthrough, do make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And also spread the word among your friends. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye.